Over the last decade, everyone knows the General Assembly has expanded the eligibility criteria for record sealing on, a multiple, on several occasions. And the Ohio Criminal Sentencing Commission has studied, reported on, and made recommendations about those changes. We have helpful resources on our website. And as Alex mentioned in the first panel, the record sealing reference guide will be posted soon. My name is Sarah Andrews. I'm the director of the Ohio Criminal Sentencing Commission. It's a pleasure to be here and moderate this impressive panel. Um, the panel this afternoon is focused on the provision in Senate Bill 288 concerning sealing or expungement of low level controlled substance offenses um, on the prosecutor's request. It authorizes a prosecutor to request the expungement of the conviction record of a low level controlled substance offense, which is defined as a violation of any provision of the drug law that is a fourth degree misdemeanor or a minor misdemeanor or of a comparable municipal ordinance. And appropriately, we have several uh, municipal representatives here with us today. I'm gonna ask the panel to introduce themselves and then we'll get into some questions and talk about how this provision will impact their work um, what the landscape looks like, and hopefully we'll finish with kind of what the challenges and opportunities ahead. And so I'll call on each panel and ask you just to give a brief introduction of yourself before we start in on the questions. And I'll start with Mark Griffin. Great. Well, thank you, Sarah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Griffin. I'm the law director for the city of Cleveland. And so as part of that, uh, our city prosecutors report uh, up to me. And uh, it was a pleasure and an honor to work with Senator Manning to try to, to push this through. Great, thank you. And Tori? Hi, I'm Tori Edwards. I'm a staff attorney at the Franklin County Municipal Court. I work for all of our 14 general division judges, drafting decisions and keeping them up to date on changes to the law, like this new prosecutor initiated record feeling. Perfect, and Brad? Thank you. I'm glad I could be here today. Uh, I'm Brad Nicodemus. I'm the assistant city attorney in Whitehall. Um, I have two prosecutors that work in uh, Franklin County Municipal Court uh, prosecuting our misdemeanor cases. Um, I also handle our mayor's court in Whitehall, uh, but I am also a, a solicitor and prosecutor for a number of villages in, in the surrounding counties that uh, have much smaller municipal courts uh, that we've been dealing with this as well. So again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. All right, and for those who may not know, where is Whitehall? Whitehall is on the east side of Franklin County. It's a suburb of Columbus. Um, like I said, east side of Franklin County. Okay, great, thank you. Cleveland and Columbus are pretty easy to figure out. <laughs> um, and so Pam? Uh, hi, yes, I'm Pam Lattimore. I um, have been, I'm at RTI International, which is a social science research firm. And I have been conducting uh, research related research and studies related to criminal justice system practices since a very long time. And uh, it's delightful to be here. And my research really has spanned everything from pretrial to uh, a current study that I have on expungement. And again, thank you for the invitation to be here. Great. We're happy to have you. And Yana, last but not least. Hi, yes. My name is Yana Hrdinova. I'm the administrative director of the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center. Uh, and we have recently done a report on uh, record sealing in Ohio, looking not only at statewide numbers, but also at uh, individual jurisdiction, as well as information about record sealing that is available on the court's website. Great. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. As I said, this is an impressive panel and we have a lot to cover. Um, so we'll get right into it. And um, you know, Mark, when we were preparing for this panel, it was our understanding that the inclusion of this prosecutor initiated record sealing was motivated by Cleveland's experience with trying to initiate record sealing on behalf of some of the residents there. Um, and I just saw recently there's a headline about the subject. Um, so could you tell us um, about that effort prior to the passage of 288 and then explain how this new law should help help you move forward. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I want to reference back a little bit to what Senator uh, Manning said in the prior panel, which was to really think about how to be smarter on crime. And, and you know, we saw that we were not being that smart. And, and just as a little bit of history, uh, I graduated high school in 1981, which was sort of the, the height of the war on crime. 
uh, where uh, you know jail terms for even minor offenses seem to be the thing to do. But but one of the things that we've seen since then is is really a change on how those laws have have uh, played out or not played out, uh, and and really a sense that that war on drugs failed. And and we saw a change in sentiment really on both sides of the aisle and really across the country. So. For example, uh, I, although we are Democrats for the most part here in, in Cleveland, uh, Congressman on, on the east side, Congressman Joyce is a Republican, and he served as a prosecutor in Geauga County, prosecuting many of these cases. And you know, he has said to us that he found that that was not an effective way of, of uh, addressing the problem. Uh, and he actually is working with uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez on marijuana reform. And so one of the things that we've seen is sort of a broad uh, change in public sentiment, public policy, uh, political policy as well. And of course, we see that in uh, legalization for medical marijuana uh, in different parts of the country, as well as recreational marijuana. And, and you know, one of the things that we saw most specifically in Cleveland was that so many of our citizens uh, were being impacted on their jobs, uh, on their ability to take uh, student loans. Um, you know, on their ability to get rental uh, places. And so, you know, there's a, there's a part of this that really talks about um, economic development. And as we talk to our businesses, the other thing that we heard from our businesses is, hey, we can't find enough workers, and yet we are screening them out for these low-level drug pieces. So we were really trying to address uh, those parts. And, and the other piece that we were hearing from our police department was, we want to go after violent crime. We don't want to deal with nonviolent, victimless, low-level marijuana possession. So uh, Mayor Bibb uh, came and said, look, we need to take a look at this. We need to be smarter about it. And so we took a look at the statute uh, and we saw, well, you know, it says that applicants can apply and maybe we'll try to be a creative approach here and we'll try to be the applicant here. Uh, and you know we want to we want to kind of push the envelope a little bit as as best we can, and so we put together a series of of motions for four thousand uh, ceiling motions uh, on the argument that we could be the applicant. Uh, well, um, the the courts first of all were overloaded. They said, "Do not bring us four thousand of anything all at once." And then secondly, they said to us, "Yeah, this is creative, but it's a little bit too creative." And so we read the statute differently, uh, and uh, you know we are not going to put these through. So you need to either withdraw them, or we are going to deny them all in a summary fashion. And so, uh, so we looked at that, and we said, look, we still have these problems out there. You know, these these issues that we are trying to address haven't gone away. Whether it's for the hiring, whether it's for uh, you know loans, and and the focus on violent crime. And so, uh, as part of that, we thought, well, what can we do? And, and we thought, well, let's try to clarify standing for prosecutors. And so uh, we reached out to Senator Manning and said, you know, hey, can we work with you on this? And, and he was tremendously uh, helpful. And so we had a variety of discussions about how to phrase the changes, you know, what do we want to do? And, you know, because there is, there is, although the sands have shifted, there is this history of people don't want to be seen as, as uh, soft on crime, understandably. Uh, but as we thought about what the scope of these changes should be, uh, we, we came to the conclusion that we didn't want to bite off more than we could chew. And so we tried to make it very focused only on marijuana, very focused on uh, low levels of possession. Uh, and so, you know, with, with the help of the General Assembly, we were able to, uh, uh, to get consensus on that. Great. Thank you. And so, Tori or Brad, were you following this work in Cleveland or did you weigh in in the um, crafting of the language? We did not weigh in on the crafting of the language. Our city of Columbus attorney's office actually came to our judges to ask kind of the same thing that Cleveland was gonna do. They had heard that Cleveland was doing it. They wondered, they wanted to take the temperature of our judges um, on this and we, our judges said the same thing that the Cleveland judges said, right? That great idea, but the statute just doesn't really provide for it at this time. So now that it does, we're obviously in a very different position. 
Brad? Yeah, and I, I was following the legislation but did not weigh in on it. Um, as Tori mentioned, Whitehall being in Franklin County, the, the city attorney's office there kind of took the lead on that. And then we got the direction from the judge. Um, for my smaller municipalities, um, it's not as much of an issue. Okay. And so before we get into maybe how the mechanics and Senate Bill 288 will affect you today and maybe in a few months, Pam and Yana, can you give us some perspective about maybe Pam from a national level, how other states look in, in relation to this particular topic and Yana, maybe how some of the research you did plays into where we are today and then we'll go back to the prosecutors or city attorneys as they are. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think it's it's really important to, to highlight what Mark said about the uh, impact of criminal records on individuals' ability to stay crime-free, right? And so there's a, you know, turning a criminal record into lifetime punishment can have an impact on public safety. And I think between that and uh, at a time of labor shortages, I think a lot of uh, uh, legislators are looking to record sealing as, as, as a way to address both of those issues. So there's a fair amount of effort across the country. We're involved um, uh, and DEPC is our partner on this. We're involved in a study for the Clean Slate Initiative that's, that's actually looking, scanning the national state level uh, records to look at efforts to do uh, expungement and, and record sealing on uh, and so, you know, there, there is a lot of activity out there, uh, and I can, I can talk maybe later about some of the challenges that are involved in that. Uh, it's not a simple thing. Uh, it's certainly, uh, it, it's not a simple thing. And, and so uh, I think it's really uh, important that, uh, uh, it, you know, the continuation of this work, but I think it needs to be done with some consideration about how hard it is. And, you know, there are tens of millions of arrests, of arrests every year nationally. So, you know, the 4,000 that Mark was referring to is a drop in the bucket uh, in terms of, of the potential of what needs to be done out there. Nana? Yes, you know, I would add, uh, you know, our research shows we, we looked at uh, numbers of record sealing in the state of Ohio from 2011 to 2021 and kind of traced uh, the developments because in the last 10 years, as has been said on the previous panels, there have been incredible changes in the law in terms of eligibility criteria, really broadening uh, the number of people who would be eligible for record sealing. Um, and what we saw, we, di we did see, you know, a significant increase. We saw a 55% increase going from about 29,000 uh, records sealed in 2011 to about 46,000 records sealed in 2021. Uh, but when you look at the actual numbers of court cases in each year, you know, it only translates to a very small percentage of potentially eligible individuals applying for record sealing. So the advantage of prosecutor-initiated record sealing or government-initiated record sealing or automatic record sealing, you know, people name it different things, is that the people don't actually have to fill out, fill out a petition. You know, it's a complicated process. Many people are not even aware of the fact that uh, they are eligible for record sealing. Um, you know, you do have to go to court for a hearing. You have to pay a fee. Uh, you know, SB 288 has limited the fee to $50. To $50. But prior to that, sometimes the fees are, you know, upwards of $150, $200, you know, which is prohibitive for many people. So I think the, the advantage of this um, uh, effort hopefully will be that more people will get the benefit of their, of their records being sealed without necessarily having to go through the process themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. But as Pam said, uh, the implementation of this great idea, I think that's where you know, rubber hits the road and that's where we really have to see what actually happens. Yeah, and so that's a great segue into um, Mark and Tori and Brad. If you can tell us if you know whether and how prosecutors in your cities may be planning to take advantage of this new power that they have. Um, let's start there. And so in, with, in any order. Uh, let me just go first and then defer to, to Tori and Brad, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, so, so we have met with uh, our clerk of courts and, and uh, presiding judge, and, and they sort of repeated what they said before, which is, don't bring us a box of 4,000 uh, um, motions. Uh, let's let's go through this in a very uh, um, structured way. 
And so, um, you know, they've asked us really to, to bring them kind of in chunks of 100 or 200. That That is the, the plan to go forward with that. Uh, but the other piece that they raised uh, had to do with the fees. And so uh, we have a, a $10,000 grant for uh, paying for um, associated filing fees. Uh, we will try to ask the courts to waive those to the extent possible. But one of our issues will be that um, uh, we won't be able to get an attestation or an affidavit of, of indigency very easily on some of these uh, prosecutor initiated expungements. So, so uh, we do, of course, have to have uh, notice uh, to the defendants. Um, and so for us, we're going to work through the 4,000 that we identified before, but do them in uh, previously identified, but then do them in chunks of 100 uh, to push them through and, uh, and to work through the funding um, as best we can. Thank you. And so just one question before Brad or Tori. So on those 4,000, did, did you make contact with all of them and the people? Do they all know that this is maybe in the future? So we served notice to everyone uh, okay. with respect to, to the prior motions. Um, okay. and, and then as we go forward on the next 100, uh, you know, the chunks of 100, we will yeah. we'll serve notice on them or at least, you know, attempt to be a regular U.S. mail to the extent possible. Wow, that's no small task in and of itself. Uh, yes. <laughs> that's why I was asking. <laughs> uh, you know, my staff, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to have uh, 17 prosecutors uh, and, I, you know, they all came together to stuff envelopes. So, wow. So, yeah. All right. All right. So, Tori? Yeah. So, here in the Franklin County Municipal Court, we're kind of unique in that we have multiple prosecuting entities that prosecute cases here. So the city of Columbus obviously prosecutes all their misdemeanors here, but we also have Whitehall where Brad practices, Hilliard, Grove City, Westerville, Canal, Winchester, Dublin. We have all these different prosecuting entities that prosecute cases here. So mostly at this point, we've been working with the city of Columbus, um, figuring out a plan that works for them and with our clerk's office to see how we can get these applications filed and figure out a workflow that makes sense for these applications. They don't have to go through the same process that defendant initiated record ceilings have to go through and that there we don't have to do this whole probation check that we do for a defendant initiated prosecution. Um, we've been working with our the city attorney's office to have to figure out if they could do the record check and just turn it into us and say yep this person looks good. Um, that way we're not putting more stress on our already very overwhelmed probation department based on the other changes to two, that 288 has um, blessed us with. So we are working on a way to make this as easy as possible just to get these moving through the system smoothly. Go ahead, Brad. All right, um, I'll give you first from, uh, you know, a, a suburb Whitehall perspective. Um, we haven't addressed the prosecutor initiated directly yet because for the past couple of years we've actually been working with a diversion group um, and specifically on the marijuana cases and, and even some low level other drug cases. Um, and they themselves received a $10,000 grant last year for this year to apply for expungement application fees. So um, our prosecutor driven um, expungement process has already kind of been started through our diversion partners who have been combing through some files. Uh, that way we know we have good contact information and, and, and they've been helping um, the defendants themselves submit the applications. Um, the, the change in 288 with the affidavit of indigency to waive the fees has helped a lot with them. Um, but as far as our, our city attorney's office is sitting down, um, again, we've we've been partnering with our, our diversion group for that. Um, flipping out to some of the other smaller municipalities, though, in uh, smaller cities and, and villages that I represent, it's a little more difficult because, as Mark mentioned, there is a lot of staff time involved um, and staff is limited. Uh, case files are are limited. I took over one municipality a couple years ago. I'm digital. The old prosecutor handed me about a dozen bank boxes full of his old paper files. So someone would have to, to run through those. Um, the other concern that's been brought up, but I think the judges are working on is 
um, in one county that I go to occasionally. Um, it just recently became a municipal court and there's one judge and he's there three days a week. And um, the way he interprets the statute, he has to set an oral hearing. We used to be able to do some of these if if I didn't object, you know, it's it's an expungement. I don't object. I don't really care if he sets it for an oral hearing. He would sign the entry sealing the record and we'd never have a hearing. Well, now he's got to figure out a way to set all of these for hearing because his interpretation says that's an oral hearing on all of them. Um, so we're still kind of working through that process um, in the smaller municipalities uh, where time is even more of a crunch with with so fewer judges. Well, thank you. And so we have a question. Well, Tori, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to note that, like Mark said, they had about 4,000 cases they were looking at. We've been told that our city attorney's office has over 6,000 cases that they think they could apply for on day one. So we're working wow. with them to not apply for all of those on day one, but apply in manageable chunks. But we're working out the math. And if we only do a few a week, that's going to take forever. So we're trying to figure out how we can work through them at a manageable pace too. So we're thinking maybe yeah. about a hundred a week. That, and, and that and that's a problem. Our, our diversion partners have already identified 750 that they could apply for on day one that we have contact information for so we can get them notice and everything. So it would be good to go. And that just adds to the 4,000 or 6,000 that Tori mentioned, because those are all in the same court. Right. We're a very busy court. <laughs> yeah. So, and still 100 a week is, like you said, going to take a while. Um, we have a question in the chat that let's talk about, or in the question and answer. I'm sorry, the chat isn't open. Um, so there's a question about with the new changes to Marcy's law, are victims in these cases being notified also? And anyone can answer. So the record, this record sealing statute itself notes that the prosecutor has to send notice to the victims of these cases if there are any. I would right. assume there are not victims to most of these cases, given that they are M4 and MM drug yeah. offenses. Um, so if there is a victim, the prosecutor does have to send notice, but I would think victims would be very rare in these cases. And that's our view also that that these are possession cases. And so the number of victims will be, you know, something close to zero. Okay, yep. thank you. All right, and so with all of that being said, the numbers and the workload and everything that goes into this provision, do you think that certain prosecutors will develop practices that will be followed by others? I mean, is, is somebody taking a lead in trying to create a guide so everybody kind of moves in the same direction or how's that working? Are you interconnected in some way? Uh, perhaps not as much as we should be. Um, so uh, Aquila Jordan, who is our chief city prosecutor, is putting together a toolkit uh, and so, you know, we'll be happy to circulate that, of course, uh, to everyone with respect to, you know, what our sample motions look like uh, and, and a draft court order as well. And, and, you know, of course, there are there are things that we need to certify in those motions or provide that, you know, we believe the person has been rehabilitated uh, and other pieces like that. And so, um, I, you know, we will certainly make those available to to anyone and everyone who uh, is interested in them. Okay. And um, Corey, I think it was you that mentioned, like, I think you said something like on day one. And, and do you know when that day is? I mean, what's your anticipated timeline for where you all are in the process? Yeah, day one for us. Have one. I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, day one is still a question mark. We don't really know exactly when it'll be. The last we heard from the city attorney's office is that they were going to find summer help to start working all these things. So we're, I'm picturing like, June or July before we see our first one of these. But we've already worked with our clerk's office to get docket codes in place and a special docket in duty for when these will be heard. So we're working the behind the scenes stuff already. So when day one happens, whenever it is, we're ready. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a little shout out to, to Tori and the Franklin County Municipal Court team because the judges down there already um, sometimes throughout the year have record sealing um, uh, events where they actually go out into the community 
um, and set up where people could come in and apply. So some of the background, at least in, in Franklin County, that helps us in Whitehall as well, is already there. Um, the, the, the issue that I see is just the volume that we all have that we can do. Yeah, our court, oh, sorry, Mark. Um, our court has a self-help resource center that helps people apply for record sealing and they um, partner with legal aid to host those clinics that we have at least once a year. And we go out to different places in the community and help people apply. And we have judges there on those days so they can sign those affidavits of indigency. So people's applications can be um, filed right then and we can get them on track to get the probation check done and have the hearing set up. So we are out in the community a lot having those clinics on the normal defendant initiated yeah. record ceiling. Okay. We have a little bit of both of those. So we have uh, one day expungement clinics that, that we do pretty much every other month. So similar to, uh, to what Franklin County is doing as well. And so, um, I, you know, the process starts in the morning and then the judges come in probably about 1.30 or two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and at least at those, we've been oversubscribed. So, you know, we plan for uh, 200 people and then 300 show up at the door. And so we have to we have to turn people away. But with respect to these marijuana um, expungements, the conversations with our court uh, started with the court telling us that they'd like to do uh, a, a single day devoted to uh, these expungements once a month. And their proposal was, OK, we'll do a thousand of these uh, one day each month. I don't know how that is possible, but but that was the discussion. I think that has been dialed back now to this wow. more manageable hundred at a time kind of kind of process. Yeah, that's ambitious. Um, yeah, if I if I may jump in, you know, I think yeah. one of my concern is, and I think it's it, it's kind of illustrated here, right? We have the Cleveland and we have the Columbus uh, people who are already thinking about it, and I, I think my concern when it comes to to this and, and record sealing in general is whether all jurisdictions across Ohio are gonna be benefiting equally from this new provision or from record sealing in general. You know, when, when we collected data from individual courts, there is some huge discrepancies where, where with some courts recording, you know, more than 100% increase in the number of record sealing applications filed from 2011 to 2021, and some, you know, noticing decrease uh, in the same time period. Now, we did not look at what cost this increase or decrease in individual jurisdictions, uh, but you know I think the question of uh, equity across the state and making sure that all Ohioans, regardless whether they live in a large urban area or a rural area, can benefit uh, from this, it's really important. It's something that the legislature should be looking at. Um, and as you know, uh, data is a huge part of it in terms of making sure that we can evaluate uh, legislative changes. Yeah, indeed. And so a couple questions. One is there's a question in the question and answer about whether or not the defendant needs to appear or if that's up to the judge's discretion. So if we can answer that one, and then I have another question for you. For applications filed here, the defendant will not need to appear. Uh, and that is the same in, in Cleveland as well. And the prosecutor initiated record sealing. Only. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I, I don't have it in writing yet, but at least one of the rural counties I'm in, that is the judge's inclination to do as well. Okay. And have you, in your respective offices, had um, defendants or people contact you directly about this prosecutor initiated record sealing and say, hey, count me in or is it mostly just the operations within your offices that are working on it? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I haven't had any uh, defendants or potential applicants contact me um, in any of my, my jurisdictions. Um, to Yana's concern, uh, being in some of the rural counties and the equitability of it getting out there, um, I, I could share her concern because I've heard from some smaller prosecutors offices a lot. Um, when you get into like southeastern Ohio in particular, where attorneys start to get scarce um, and, and prosecutors become even scarcer, uh, they work different jobs. Uh, the reason I prosecute a number of municipalities is because they didn't have anybody to prosecute them. And so I was available to go out and, and do them. Um, so if they're working regular 
uh, firm jobs or private practice jobs, um, they're just there prosecuting here and there. Um, some of them may not be as familiar with it. Um, I have had one uh, prosecutor from, from a small municipality reach out and, and ask me how I plan on handling it. But, um, you know, that, that concern is there that when you get into the the more rural areas with with fewer legal resources, um, that the the prosecutor initiated side isn't isn't going to be as uh, utilized as it could be. Right. Yeah, I think public education across the board is probably key to many of the changes in the law. And so, Pam, hearing this conversation and knowing that a number of states have passed various automatic or government initiated record sealing laws in the last ten years or so. Um, implementation is sometimes a struggle. <laughs> so can you give us an idea of why states are now adopting the laws and what some of the common implementation challenges are? Sure. And as I was sitting here listening to the discussion, it it, it, it sounds uh, very much like what's taking place in Ohio is uh, very hands-on labor intensive identification of cases, the the manually going through and, and confirming that a case is eligible. Uh, Mark mentioned having prosecutors stuffing envelopes to do the notification. And um, I, I, so, you know, that's a huge resource demand. The uh, states that we've been looking at that have uh, developed automated systems, um, have also encountered challenges because it, the the range is is much broader than what's been done in Ohio so far, and so the potential number of cases is 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 pretty substantial. And the other issue, though, is the structures of the of the laws when they're passed and the conditions that are placed on uh, access to um, you know this automated expungement process. And what happens is, you know, very well-meaning legislation that wants to target um, relief to individuals that, um, the say, simple possession of marijuana uh, cases or something simpler, low-level drug cases, drug possession cases, will add a, a, a many caveats to the, uh, uh, you know, to the requirements. And so it's like an, the individual can't have been arrested. And if they had an arrest before, they've had to complete their sentence. They've had to pay all their fees and fines. They've had to, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, meet a whole variety of conditions. And the underlying problem with that, and Sarah, you'll be familiar with this, is that the availability of reliable data in specific parts of the criminal justice system uh, is spotty. It, it, you know, it varies from place to place, but it can be very spotty. And then the ability to link records across these systems, it, it can be virtually impossible in some states. And, you know, I think Ohio, because you don't have a centralized court system, uh, is, is an example of a state where there's exacerbation of around these issues. Uh, and uh, we're doing some work on another project in another state. And, you know, their administrative office of the courts, they also have a decentralized system. Their administrative office of the courts doesn't even get any records from some of their courts. And so, you know, there are these gaping holes. And so if, if, if the requirement is the individual should not have had any other convictions, where is that information going to come from? Uh, and, you know, other than, you know, you know it's, it basically, where is that information going to come from? And so uh, in our project right now, we've decided that we're going to set forth and try to at least put together a grid that says, if you have these kinds of requirements, when you start talking about expunging or sealing um, offenses, then you're going to need data from law enforcement, you're going to need data from the courts, you're going to need data, you know, again, places where probation officers are local, right? If, if you've got supervision fees that were attached to the marijuana conviction, has the individual paid those fees? So are you going to have to go to, you know, the specific county probation office and hope that the probation officer kept, you know, you know the record, the, the manila folder that had that this guy had paid, you know, his fees? And so, it's a massive hurdle and states that have been very ambitious in trying to do this, I think, or have just sort of run slam into the implementation barriers. 
I've been, as I noted, I mean, I've been doing work in this field for almost 40 years now, and maybe the data are, are better, but they're certainly not 40 years better. And I, I pin that on, you know, just a failure of governments to invest in the the IT infrastructure that's really necessary to support um, what are very well-meaning legislative, you know, well-meaning legislative efforts. Right. Yeah, we hear everybody says, let's see how the data goes. And, you know, even the first panel talking about let's pump the brakes and yeah. see what the results are, but we need information to analyze those results. And so, Yana, I want to talk about, have you talked about anyway, the your report and the research you did, but before we get there, Pam mentioned it a couple of times, and there's a question about it. You know, we hear the terms seal and expunge somewhat interchangeably. And so um, but with it, specifically for this provision, Tori or Mark or Brad, will you give us a ex expunge seal 101 <laughs> and how it relates to this prosecutor initiated record sealing? Can take this one. Um, so, like they described in the first panel, sealing a record seals it from public view, and it can only be seen for certain reasons by certain people. Expunging a record permanently destroys it. Um, this new code section gives the prosecutors the option to pick which one of those they would. They're asking the court to do. So each application will ask the court to either seal or expunge. And do you know what? How you'll weigh? the decision? I mean, what what's the tipping point, one or the other? Do you know? I think our judges will just see what the prosecutor is asking for. Um, I think we'll either grant or deny what they're asking for. We're not going to like switch it from one or the other. Um, I know our city has been thinking about whether expungement is right for people who might be, have like citizenship issues. So they're looking into whether expungement is good for is a good thing to give everyone, maybe people who aren't asking for it in case they will need access to their own records later and expungement would get rid of those records, obviously. So our, our inclination in Cleveland would be to ask for expungement um, rather than sealing. Um, so that'll be kind of our um, our thoughts. I, can I just jump in here yes. and, and make a, uh, a, a small point? And this is from my researcher point of view, which is, if the records are expunged, it will be impossible to determine the impact of the legislation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and related to that, a, a concern in the research community that you know goes well back is is that even with sealing, if the legislation doesn't include uh, access to the seal records by researchers, um, again, the uh, the ability to to determine the impact. Of, uh, of of the law is going to be impossible I, and not not difficult. It will be impossible. Yeah, exactly. And, and so I just feel it's important that people consider that. Uh, and I mean, we've run into situations, even getting arrest data where certain uh, offices feel that um, researchers don't have any right to access arrest records. And, you know, how can you do studies of the rearrest of individuals if you can't get access to the arrest records? So mm -hmm. um, I, I acknowledge that expungement may be more appropriate for, for a certain, under certain circumstances, but I just wanted to point out the implications of that if, if that's the route that's taken. And maybe you could, you could drill down on that and, and explain a little bit uh, why expungement would make a difference in terms of, of research and, and can't you figure out the impact by looking for the number of expungement uh, motions that have been approved. So, I mean, I think I think the question from a public safety standpoint, at least you know, a question from a research and public safety standpoint, is what's the potential for individuals who had a record sealed to engage in future criminal activity? And if you don't know that they had prior criminal activity, you can't know that they had. There's no way to determine. You know, if if my record and it, it, it may be less. Uh, certainly the lower level of the offense that you're talking about, and, and particularly in an area where uh, the off offense you're talking about is basically being decriminalized anyway, it may, it may matter less, 
But, you know, I've spent much of my career doing models of um, individuals who were on probation and looking at the effect, for example, of drug treatment uh, on uh, recidivism, criminal recidivism. And in order to be able to look at recidivism, you have to have arrest records and, and reincarceration records. And here, if, you know, if I were a lawmaker, I would say, OK, we decided to seal these records. Uh, did anything good or bad result from that? So are individuals who had their records sealed more likely to get employment? Well, if you don't know who the individuals are who had their records sealed, you can't look to see whether they were more likely to get employment. So the ability to look downstream past the event is, is, is short-circuited by, uh, uh, by the erasure of, of the record and, and also by uh, not allowing researchers to have access to identified records to be able to answer those questions. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of a technicality, but I think it's an important one to keep in mind. If you really want to know the outcomes downstream, you have to know who these individuals are and be able to look at, at what the outcomes were. And I think, you know, just to follow up on Pam's point, uh, we we sent emails uh, and and website requests to 209 of the 241 Ohio courts, and there was a number of of clerks or you know courts that have sent responses saying uh, we cannot you know give you information about the number of uh, of cases sealed or applications filed. I, you know I was not asking for any individualized uh, 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 information. I was simply asking for an overall number. Uh, and even then some courts were not able to provide it. Um, of the 209 courts, uh, only 36 courts were able to give me information about a number of applications filed. Um, and 36 other courts were able to give me uh, information on number of, of applications granted. So the availability of data um, in across courts, especially in a non-unified system, where every court seems to have a different management system, you know, it's 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 going to be an issue. Um, and then, you know, in addition to that, you know, the other information part of it is also the information provided to the public. Uh, you know, that was another thing we looked at. We actually looked at uh, individual websites of all uh, 241 courts. Um, and only about 112 provided uh, record sealing applications on their websites. Um, only 44 courts provided information about eligibility. And of those 44 courts, only six of them had actual accurate eligibility criteria posted on their websites. Uh, some courts had applications for record sealing that had uh, you know, a first time offender language in it, uh, which, you know, creates huge issues because that was the law in 2012 um, and hasn't been the law since. So just information, uh, informing the public of accurate eligibility criteria um, is, is, seems to be an issue when it comes to the courts. And, and I'll just add one one more thing that uh, I, I think is important to look at from a policy, perspe policy perspective, which is is um, to to be able to determine whether the law is being uh, implemented equitably, or, or or whether there are certain groups that are being privileged by the the existence of the law, and other groups are 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 not being given access to it. So basically, whether I mean the issue came up earlier about rural versus urban areas, but here you would even, you, you could even consider within a jurisdiction whether, uh, you know, just to use an example, whether females are being more likely to get access to this remedy than than males or, or you know, a certain age group or, you know, any kind of thing. So to be able to examine that issue, you have to, again, have access to uh, information on um, on who has who has had access to the remedy, who has received the remedy, and uh, and who has not. And so there's even that more basic implement implementation question, which I would think at minimum would be important uh, uh, to to be able to study. Uh, that, like I say, so that's why I think it's just really important to consider um, consider that. And 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 if you were going to do expungement. For there to be some way to at least gather summary type statistics, so that you you know you're 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 counting things before you erase them, erase the identified record completely. So, um, but you know, actually, come to think about it, there might be a way to have a de-identified record that. But again, these are you know things that need to be considered. And I guess for the implementation piece, Mark and Brad and Tori. 
have you thought about, I'm guessing that you all internally keep records. And so have you thought about how to share that information outside of your own office, so to speak? So we know oh. if it's working. <laughs> So for defendant initiated record sealing, we, our clerk's office produces a year, a year end report every year that lists the number of applications filed, the number of applications granted. So we do make this like metadata of those total filings available, but obviously not like individualized data. And similarly in, in Cleveland, uh, our clerk of courts does, does that as well. And, you know, we know that we're going to be questioned about how many prosecutor initiated um, expungements or sealings have you achieved since the passage of the law? So, so we expect to be able or uh, to be uh, questioned about those issues. And again, uh, one of my jurisdictions, Franklin County, so they, they we get that clerk's report. Uh, some of the rural ones, um, I, I, based on the technology they use, is the availability of the data. So I know. At least for my jurisdiction, I will be I will have a record of what was prosecutor initiated um, and, and hopefully the clerk's offices in those smaller courts will have something if it's requested. Um, but I know from my perspective, because I have much fewer cases out there, it's also easier for me to keep and tabulate that data. And so aside from <clears throat> this uh, implementation challenge. Do you all foresee what other challenges and what you know what you're thinking, your planning efforts? What are you anticipating being the most difficult? And maybe what do, what would be what you're looking forward to as um, a quick win or successes? Well, for one quick win for me would be one judge has a rule that prosecutors show up to every expungement hearing. Um, and I'm hoping he's going to change that. <laughs> that would be a quick win for me. Uh, we have sort of a, a fundamental win on how to pay for these uh, in an appropriate way. So, for example, as we go through 100 at a time, do we have to cut a separate check for each of those? And so we're working with our finance department and the clerk of courts to essentially create an account that that the clerk can draw down on. Uh, for each of the uh, for each of the expungements, so so that's sort of a very basic piece about how do we account for the fees per case, uh, and then uh, the need to uh, to budget for the fees that we need to pay. And you know, before you answer, Tori, let me ask Mark it, that begs the question: Do you and Tori and Brad, you have this initial number now that you're looking at four thousand, six thousand? But after this initial number, are you anticipating the number to be fewer, or do you do you have a sense of what the annual number, or are you thinking about it in annual terms? How how does that work for implementation? So I'll just answer. Oh, go ahead, Tori. Please go ahead. Um. So our the city of Columbus has stopped charging people with a lot of these offenses that are now sealable and expungeable under this. So their new case numbers shouldn't keep growing. So that number of theirs will be pretty static. Um, some of our other smaller suburban prosecutors do still prosecute these offenses, so their numbers will keep growing. But I think not all of them are as interested in doing this prosecutor initiated sealing as the city of Columbus is. So the city's number shouldn't increase. Uh, we hope the city of Cleveland's number will not increase either. Um, a few years ago, the city uh, issued an instruction to no longer charge for these low-level marijuana uh, issues. However, not all of our police uh, officers followed that instruction. And so one of the things that we found was that in addition to the 4,000 convictions, there were 800 pending cases that had been charged kind of against the policy rules uh, on how to deal with that. So, so uh, we are trying to do a better job to make sure that none of these slip through the cracks. And, you know, the hope is that once we get through the 4,000, uh, there will not be any significant new ones coming through. Mark, can I actually ask a follow-up question? Because, um, you know, when I read the statute, it said clearly convictions. So would dismissed cases uh, would still be eligible for prosecutor-initiated sealing? Because it seems like it's only limited to convictions. 
Yeah, we did not. In those cases that were pending, uh, we simply dismissed. But we had we had 838 pending charges on uh, on marijuana issues that should not have been charged at all. So so we had to withdraw those. And so they, those were not subject to revised code. Uh, we could simply do that directly. Corey, I cut you off about you know what are some a quick win and maybe some other implementation challenges. So why don't you answer that for us? Um, the hardest thing for us to implement so far is figuring out who's going to hear these cases and when. Um, so we've been working on creating a special time during the week that our duty judge will hear. Well, that all these cases will be scheduled, um, and then if if people come, if defendants show up for them, great. They don't have to, um, and then we can just hear all those cases, you know, all at the same time, versus having to send all these cases through our assignment office and get them all individually assigned to one of our 14 judges, and them all be on their own little time track with those judges. We have created a process to just send those all to Judy, so they will be handled in a more efficient and consistent manner. And. From your experience, have you all, from where you sit in the criminal justice or public safety collaborative world, has there been, um, has everyone else been as supportive or have you had some difficulties within the law enforcement community, for example, or has everybody got on board and said, this is a good idea and we want to make it work? Or has I, I, said I, I personally have some some jurisdictions with officers that still um, will will enforce the marijuana law. I'll still see citations with them. Um, quite frankly, they I, to me, it's become a pretext like a pretextual traffic stop at this point that they, they're they're using it to get into search a vehicle um, and. Uh, to Pam's point, I like data. Um, I, I like data. And so I'm trying to figure out how many times are they writing someone a marijuana citation and searching a vehicle and delaying that person getting to work and not finding anything versus that one time they find something else. Um, so I, I still have some, uh, some agencies uh, uh, enforcing that when I get the marijuana charge. Um, I I typically do one of two things if I have a diversion, if there's some other thing going on, because um, uh, in different areas, I'm associated with different groups that can also help with employment or child care. So we use it as a way to get someone engaged in services if they're needed. Um, and then if not, I usually end up dropping the case. Okay. Uh, so we have also had the issue of, of a handful of police officers, and I think this is why they were being charged incorrectly beforehand, using marijuana as probable cause to, to search a vehicle. And so they would say that they smell it and then and then use that to search the vehicle. Um, your question also asked whether there was any kind of pushback. And, and I don't know if this is quite pushback, but one of the things that we did uh, when we so so it, just as part of your your question earlier about uh, what our feedback has been from the general public. Um, so when we first tried to do our motions uh, pre SB 288, uh, I, people were calling and crying that they were happy that we were doing this. I mean, it was really an emotional outreach. Uh, and then interestingly, once we served notice and we we delivered um, first class mail of say, hey, you know, we filed this motion, we got a lot of calls about, is this a trap? Uh, is this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't trust you. Is this some mm -hmm. way that you're gonna call me in and get me arrested? And so uh, that was sort of the other pushback from parts of the community because, uh, you know, there is a disconnect between law enforcement, understandably, and, and members of the community. Yeah, I guess uh, from my experience, I feel like Pam now, I'm gonna say I've been in this business a long time. There's just a, a central distrust no matter who the players are. <laughs> whether they're defendants or, you know, colleagues, criminal justice just breeds some distrust sometimes. And so that makes sense that, you know, you see the um, shows and segments that have people brought in for, you know, oh, you won a prize and no, you didn't. <laughs> um, so what are some of the key 
takeaways for you guys um, as far as implementation? And then Pam, what advice would you have for them? Maybe what you know nationally and Yana, I think it's really important for you to talk a little bit more about your experience and just trying to work through what we know here in Ohio once mm -hmm. we talk, hear from Tori and Mark and Brad again. So what are your takeaways, Tori? What do you what what do you think? I mean, what's your immediate future plan and, and what you're going to work through first? Um, I think I'm just excited but nervous for us to finally start getting some of these filings to make sure that this system we've built can actually get this done in the way we want it to. Yes, one of my key takeaways in it, it kind of goes into the other expungement law changes is since we had that diversion partner set up that has a grant to um, pay for the fees and on the prosecutor led ones, uh, the court can waive that fee to be able to help um, those people that are um, at the poverty line or below the poverty line, the working poor, um, those that just can't pay the $50 to get it filed um, to identify the ones that we could do prosecutor led and see about getting a fee waived and then allow the diversion partners to pay the fee for those um, that might not fall into the prosecutor led category because they have other convictions. Um, and that way we can help um, a greater number of people uh, in, in sealing and expunging some of their, their past history. And Mark, before you answer, we have a question in the question and answer that deals with the dismissed cases that you mentioned. Um, well, sort of, I'm, I'm making it okay. <laughs> relatable. <laughs> That's what it said to me. So with the minor misdemeanor and misdemeanor four charges that are dismissed outright, will those be expunged since the records would still be available to be viewed online? within that specific court, county, or government website? Uh, no, they, they would not be expunged. Okay. Uh, but but just to follow up on uh, what Brad said in your question about, about uh, you know, what I've learned, it certainly is to coordinate with the clerk of courts and the judges um, and to really try to understand their uh, managerial dilemmas on how they, they work through these things. And um, and I and I'm interested in hearing from Brad and Tori as well about uh, the ability to waive fees. Our our clerk of courts has taken the position that that you could only waive if there is an affidavit of indigency, and uh, SB 288 simply says the judge can waive. And wondering whether your courts have taken a different view about whether they need an affidavit or not. Uh, and and it also says that they are allowed to charge a maximum of $50 uh, for costs and whether there's been any discussion about charging less than that. Yeah, so it, the statute does make it very clear that it is a maximum of $50 um, and it does say the court can waive. I don't think that waiver is at all tied to the affidavit of indigency that can be filed for a defendant to apply or the affidavit can be filed in any kind of case. I don't think those are tied together at all. So in Franklin County, uh, judges are willing to waive fees without an affidavit of indigency? So in prosecutor initiated record sealing and expungement applications, um, the judges are considering waiving that fee without an affidavit. It's great to know. And do you, once those decisions are made, will you have maybe a network to share that information and learn from each other, I hope? Yeah, I think this panel has been great at connecting um, at least my department with Mark's. I've been emailing his um, chief prosecutor about the form that they've created and maybe what we would use. And I'm, I'm planning on sharing that with the city attorney's office and seeing, hey, how can, if this could be a statewide thing that we're all doing this the same way, that'd be great. Yeah, and, and I'm going to take some of what I've learned today, I've been jotting some notes down on stuff because um, I'm I'm giving a presentation on Friday to the Ohio Municipal League Attorneys Association on uh, Senate Bill 288. So, uh, you know, if the way the networks work, get it from here and then pass it along, um, and then it, it flows back and forth. Um, and I, I imagine with within a few months, if not a year, at, at least 
those of us in the larger municipalities and, and some of the more centralized and, and larger counties, I have a feeling that our prosecutor led uh, motions will all look fairly similar. <laughs> yeah. And so Pam, from a national perspective, or even from what you know, from working in Ohio and with the Drug Enforcement and Policy Center, what what advice would you give to us as practitioners in, in looking ahead? And where do you, if you had a crystal ball, <laughs> what would you say we'll be talking about in six months? Oh, you're muted though. I I have a, 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 a another comment before I get to that. It, you know, I've been working, uh, I've had projects in the pre-trial space for the last six or seven years. And like I say, I mean, my research, I, I spent a lot of my career looking at basically, you know, prisoner reentry and probation and, and you know, basically sentenced individuals. And so the exposure to pretrial was sort of eye-opening for me. And, I, you know, the, the cu couple of comments earlier about um, whether uh, this law applies only to um, convictions and not to dismissals and not to arrest. You know, that was one of the things that struck me as we started our Clean Slate project. It's like, wait a minute. So if you're convicted, you can get your record sealed. But if charges were never brought, it sits on your record. And, and you know, so, you know, not being a lawyer, like I say, not really having worked in the space, it was like, well, wait a minute, how fair is that? And 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 then uh, you know another project that I have that is specifically pre-trial, you know the realization that there can be, you know, 30, 40 percent of a, of arrests are basically orphaned, right? And and that you know people are arrested, they go to jail, and then there's never charges are never brought, and it's a huge number. This is a large municipality in in the United States where is one of the sites that we're working in, and it's like. You know, where did these, you know, these 15,000 jail bookings, people who spent at least one night in jail and there were never any, you know, there's no charges that were ever brought. And and then to think that those arrests remain on a record in a, in a state where if the individual had been charged and and um, and convicted, there's remedy. But if you've just been arrested and booked and never charged, there's no remedy just seems um, like a huge gap in the, uh, you know, in in, in policy and practice and and you know and something that uh you know we've seen as we've scanned the the national landscape on expungement uh and record sealing and you know states that don't have anything i mean there's no there's no petition I, you know i think ohio may have been almost in that boat no petition base no any uh avenue for expungement but then when you think about these different levels of sort of you know, I used to call it, it's almost like penetration into the system, right? You're arrested or, you know, charged or you're convicted. Uh, that that the most serious of those could be something where you have remedy and the less serious of, of those are places where you don't, I think is something that policymakers need to pay attention to. And, and then the, the other, just to sort of come back to the discussion around the data issues is, you, you know, it's not only important that, um, that, that, legal and criminal justice, criminal legal system agencies have good computer systems and good management information systems and so forth. But those systems need to be able to talk to each other. And it sort of goes back to, to being able to find out whether this individual who has a conviction, have they been arrested again? And if there's no common identifier, then it's not going to be possible from a practical standpoint to, to know that. And uh, and and you know I've seen it all over the country that you know it's like well if you want to if you want to match a jail booking record with a court record you know you've got name and birth date good luck right <laughs> and so uh, you know I mean I think again this is probably more of an issue for lawmakers and providing sufficient resources but I think it's important for individuals who are operating you know doing the hard work down on the ground like you know our prosecutors here to understand that that these behind the scenes systems are really important to making your job easier in terms of identifying the cases that, that would be eligible for uh, expungement as well as following through to make sure that they're eligible. And so uh, I think that's, the, you know, at least one of the big takeaways that we have because that's certainly the thing that's standing in the way of a lot of implementation. I mean, states that have implemented pretty broad based uh, expungement legislation 
are now two, three, four, five years. We were supposed to be doing impact evaluations in states that we haven't been able to do them because nobody's implemented. Okay. Yeah, so Yana, that's a great segue. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and I think Pam is absolutely right. I think what she's describing would be, you know, the, the ideal situation. Uh, I am going to be a little bit less uh, optimistic or maybe aggressive in what I hope for because I know the challenges uh, of Ohio. Um, I think having data from each jurisdiction being reported out uh, alone would be, you know, incredibly helpful, whether it's done, uh, you know, whether it's reported to the Ohio uh, Supreme Court or whether it's uh, uh, BCI being required to, to report on record sealing orders by jurisdiction and annually, you know, that alone would give us a lot of information about what is going on across the state of Ohio. So that would be one thing. Uh, the other thing is, you know, we, we all know that courts uh, or, or any jurisdiction is, is strapped for resources. So I do not expect, you know, every court to be able to have a beautiful mobile, you know, accessible website. You know, that's just not realistic. Uh, but maybe one way to do it is to create some kind of a centralized um, clearinghouse of information about record sealing, you know, whether it's record sealing applications. Uh, I know Ohio Supreme Court has uh, a record sealing form that courts can use. Not every court uses it, of course, but you know that there, there are ways, there are small steps that you can take uh, that would be impactful in terms of making information uh, more accessible to all Ahoyans, reg regardless of where they are, um, as well as simplifying the process by using a unified form for record sealing. You know, that seems like um, uh, low hanging fruit uh, in my book. And then, of course, you know, if people don't know about it, nobody's going to use it regardless. Uh, so whether the legislature can consider some kind of a public information campaign um, surrounding record sealing, you know, again, you know, maybe pie in the sky, but that would be that would be what I would wish for. And so on those um, events, you know, the, the um, legal days, the record sealing forums, or I forget what they're called, um, but so help me, Tori. We call them clinics. Yeah, clinics. Yeah. Um, is this provision now part of those or will it be? So this provision won't be part of okay. the clinics that we've been doing. Um, this will kind of be two, two trains going down two different tracks. Okay. Um, yeah. And you know, because if, if the I prosecutor's could... office is going to do all the work on these on okay. the front end. So versus the defendant doing all the work on the other ones on the front end, so. And if I could put plug in, uh, you know, our center is planning on sending out a survey to all prosecutors uh, as well, county, countywide prosecutors as well as municipal prosecutors, asking them about uh, their approach to uh, prosecutor initiated record sealing. And then we are planning on a follow up uh, survey 12 months from now as well, hoping to get a sense of you know who is taking advantage of this uh, and who isn't, and of course, uh, our results will be depending on people answering those questions. So, if there are any prosecutors listening, um, please, please, please fill out a survey. It will not take you more than five minutes. I promise. Yeah. And, um, so we have a few minutes left, and I don't have any more canned questions. But <laughs> so I I think it's important for folks to hear from you, Tori and Mark and Brad about your experience and you know um, your aspirations and and how how we can help or you know is is there more to do just kind of a a few parting words i guess would be great i think what pam's been talking about about the fact that technology isn't always keeping up with the access we need to the data that's such a big thing um, if we had a unified court system, things could be so much easier here. Um, other states that do have those can just get these things done so much easier than we can in Ohio with our very segmented courts and record keeping and everything. Um, so that would be my idea. Like if we could have a unified court system, everything would be so much easier. Yeah. But for this, I think this is a great step in the right direction. I think the fact that it does only cover convictions is maybe like a misstep. Um, that could be something that maybe uh, Senator Manning mm -hmm. could work on if he had stayed on the call. Um, but it just, it's nice that this is doing something for people without them asking, right? That, that helps the 
lack of knowledge in the community on record sealing, right? If, if we or if prosecutors are initiating these things, we're not relying on someone to know about their rights. We're like taking that step for them, which I think is, is really nice and should be more of a wide ranging result, like for more different people um, than relying on someone to know about it. Just following up on what Tori said, uh, yeah, being able to initiate it from a prosecutor's office uh, really can make a difference in people's lives. And, and people are busy and they, they don't know about these things. And, you know, we can't expect them to, to uh, all be lawyers, um, fortunately. Uh, and so this is an opportunity where, where we can really make a difference in people's lives and, and right some of the wrongs from, uh, you know, a prior drug policy that, that was unfair, discriminatory, and, and didn't make sense. So. Uh, the other takeaway is is how hard and complicated this is. And so, you know, we've done something this year, but uh, it really just is the first step and we need to keep working on it because, uh, uh, you know, I will tell you that, that you know, as I mentioned before, we were surprised by how many people called us uh, to thank us. Uh, and so um, as complicated as it is, um, you know, we need to keep moving forward. And I just want to or kind of what Tori said it I think not including the dismissals is maybe an oversight and I would hope that um, in this general assembly that they would uh, maybe update that because uh, you know some of us we still do have officers writing them and I'm dismissing them and as Pam noted there's the arrest is still out there um, what I I'm fortunate in one jurisdiction because I have the diversion partner so that when I dismiss one, I can send them to them and, and they can help do the application for the expungement now, but I don't have that in everywhere and, that, and that's not available. So hopefully that gets updated in the future so that as we get these arrests, we can just go ahead and initiate that um, expungement uh, and not need a conviction because it, it, it does seem to be just a little bit of an oversight. Right. And so we have a couple questions in the chat, or I'm sorry, I keep saying chat, question and answer. Um, and so the one is, if a minor drug offender was convicted of a co-occurring traffic offense, are those related traffic offenses allowed to be included in the prosecutor-initiated sealing expungement process? Or is this inclusive of standalone drug offenses only? I can my reading, or go ahead. Oh, my my reading of this is it's just the drug offense, um, the the traffic offense, because not all traffic offenses can be expunged anyway. Though that kind of changed a little bit with the bill um, regarding bond forfeitures on traffic offenses. But uh, my interpretation is if you had the uh, traffic offense and a uh, uh, low level marijuana offense here, it's only the marijuana offense. My, that's my view as well. And here, those those two offenses would be in different case numbers. I don't know how it works in Cleveland, but here you'd get like a TRD for your driving offense and a CRB for your um, drug case. So they would be in two separate cases here too. So your, your traffic case is never going to be the same case as your drug case. So these would just be for the, the criminal drug cases only, which would never include a traffic offense. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, um, any any final thoughts from the panel? I think we're gonna end right on time. I see 229. <laughs> Just right. to say thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you guys so much. We appreciate all your work. Um, we know it's a, a lot and the investment you're making. So thank you. We look forward, maybe Yana and, and Pam and well, all of us, we can come back, Professor Berman and, uh, six months or a year and say, where are we now? Uh, you have an open invitation. We're trying to book you for next week because already <laughs> there's more questions to answer. But no, thank you all. I want to just jump in and, and give my appreciations as well. Just a terrific discussion. So interesting. And, and um, you know, the work that you're doing is, we know, so impactful for so many people. And so hopefully you you can feel that, feel it in part by how many people signed up to listen in and, and just so very grateful for everything you did. And thanks, Sarah, for taking over the... Uh, Moderating duties, not not as easy as you make it look. So oh yeah. Well, happy to help. Glad to be here. Thanks so much. Everybody have a great afternoon. Enjoy this wonderful weather. Yeah. Thank thanks you. so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Great. Bye. Take care.